Hello and welcome to Play On, the Morgan Sports Law podcast. I'm Ben Cisneros, an associate at Morgan Sports Law, and today I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Donna Bartley, as well as two special guests, Christina Filippu and Christopher Davis. Christina is the Principal Lecturer in Accounting, Economics and Finance in the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Portsmouth. Christina is a football finance expert and she co-authored a report on football financial sustainability for the DCMS as part of the government response to the fan-led review of football governance and also heads up the football finance course for the Premier League's Elite Academy Manager Programme. Christopher is a principal at Xera Consulting, a leading finance consultancy which specialises in regulatory finance. He is responsible for coordinating Oxera's Regulation and Market Design Centre of Excellence and has advised a number of high-profile clients on numerous regulatory and strategic issues, including the NHS and the CMA. Chris has also consulted for the DCMS on the government response to the fan-led review. In this episode, we will be discussing the white paper published last week setting out the government's proposals for an independent regulator of English football, an IREF for short. That white paper followed the fan-led review of football governance, which had been published in November 2021, and sets out the government's plan to ensure the long-term sustainability of the English football pyramid. By way of very brief overview, the White Paper proposes establishing in legislation a new licensing system for football clubs operating in the top five tiers of the English football pyramid, overseen by an independent regulator established as an arm's length body of the government. Under the proposals, football clubs will be required to comply with license conditions which seek to ensure club sustainability and the overall stability of the English football pyramid and to protect the cultural heritage of football clubs for their fans. We'll get into some of the detail of the white paper shortly, but first I'd like to ask our guests what what your overall impressions are of the white paper and of the government's proposals for an independent regulator in English football. I can jump in on that one if if you'd like. Uh, first of all, Ben, just to say um, thanks very much for having me on the podcast. As you mentioned, I have a bit of a niche in regulatory economics. So combining that with being a football fan, this is something of huge interest to me. I should start by congratulating the DCMS team who've put this together. I think a lot of work has gone into the white paper, starting from the fan-led review in late 2021 and and thinking very carefully about each of the issues that that fan-led review raised. And I think it's a good piece of work that's been done that is in an area that is both a first of its kind and very challenging to come to a position on lots of those issues. So I should just start by by mentioning that. In terms of where that white paper's got to, I don't think there's any huge surprises in there for anyone who's been following closely since the fan-led review. All the core bits that we might have expected are in there. And I think that's probably testament to the work that was done at the time of the fan-led review that actually that's managed to survive with the last 15 months of, of external challenge as well. So overall, I think it looks like it's been quite well received. I think as lots of people have already noted in the media, this seems to be a policy that's got cross-party support within Whitehall. And actually, the main questions that have been raised haven't really been about the policy itself, but about why it's taken 15 months to get here and how to make sure it doesn't drag out even longer into the future. So I think actually this is something that that seems like we are one step closer to this being reality, even if there is some pushback from within the Premier League, which you would expect to a proposal of this kind. I think overall the reaction has been very positive from what I've seen. And what about you, Christina? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's been an interesting process. It is it is groundbreaking in in many ways. Although in others, it's basically bringing in regulation to ensure that football clubs are run like businesses. So it depends on who you discuss this with from a kind of political and, and kind of general angle. It is it is groundbreaking and, and, you know, I can see a lot of benefits, which we'll be discussing later. But it's quite funny when I talk to my compliance contacts, you know, a lot of them think that it doesn't really go far enough. And in, in many ways, it's just saying run football like like a business, <laughs> which kind of brings up some worrying questions about the state of football as it is right now. I think I would just to add to that, it's clear that the the intentions of the white paper are, are positive and, and wanting to make real 
positive lasting change on football. I think I would say that it does seem that there are still quite a lot of important details that would need to be worked out to make sure that it does function as it's it's truly intended. So to start with that, then maybe we could look at the rationale. So Christina, um, what is the basis for the government's intervention here? And, and, and do you think that intervention is justified? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, the government has, in both the white paper and the government response to the fan led review, kind of going back into the process, justified their own reasons for kind of getting involved. But obviously, the kind of main remit is around sustainability, financial sustainability in particular. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, I've done quite a lot of work in this area. And generally, the landscape, the financial landscape of football has has not been great for a while. We've seen a lot of administrations over the years. Around 40% of clubs in the top four leagues have gone into administration since the Premier League was created, which is, you know, a pretty drastic figure uh, if you look at it kind of as an industry-wide purpose. So there's a lot of issues. And part of the the, the reason for, for getting involved is effectively markets exist to kind of function in a way that should kind of show the value of the businesses that they create and part of the problem with football is that the free market doesn't necessarily value the social and economic impacts of football in the community and I think that's why regulation has come into place and that's the rationale for putting regulation into place in this in this particular industry. Fans are effectively faced with a monopoly because although the industry as a whole is a competitive one in in many ways obviously people don't once, once you've got a club, you don't really change and go support the one next door if your club goes into administration. So from a consumer standpoint, and I hate using this word um, in terms of fans, but if we're talking about businesses from a consumer standpoint, fans are faced in a monopoly situation and regulation exists in, in most areas where we have monopoly industries. So it's unsurprising that this has eventually come about. Yeah, I, mean, I would see that quite similarly, I guess, from from an economist's perspective, your question you sort of split into two parts, which is, is there a problem with how the market's functioning? Are, are there market failures there? And if so, is the government the best place to fix it or a government intervention of some kind best place to fix that? I think in terms of the market functioning, first of all, it's clear that there's lots of good, lots of successes, right, in the football sector. And I think the that comes across clearly both in the fan led review and in and in the in the white paper if you look in terms of revenue growth and re- viewership growth if you look in terms of the quality of football we're pretty blessed with what we have in in english football and that shouldn't be forgotten as we as we go through this process but the rationale for intervention is that there's a problem with how the market functions in terms of the lack of financial su- sustainability uh, and the potential social cost that that imposes when football clubs go out of business. I think that that financial weakness in the system is really clear. It's clear that lots of clubs are walking a tightrope, and particularly when you go below the Premier League, actually into the Championship and League One and League Two. Christina and Kieran's paper for, for the department showed that very clearly. If you look at wage to revenue ratios in the championship, I think it's 125% wage to revenue ratio on average. And that hides the fact that there's some clubs with, you know, two times wage to revenue ratios. And the scale of losses across these clubs is quite significant. So it, so it is fairly worrying in terms of financial resilience. Probably the, the harder thing to quantify is actually what what is the social cost when clubs go bankrupt? That is a fairly subjective and emotive evidence base, I would say. So people have responded quite strongly to Berry and Macclesfield and other clubs going bankrupt. But there is the question, actually, what has the impact of that been on the local economy? What has the impact of that been on the town? And I'd say in other sectors, banking and utilities and so on, where we see regulation, it is more obvious that there's an essential service rationale than there perhaps is in football. But you know, people can clearly see there is some emotional connection that that people have to their football club. So in terms of the market functioning, I think, you know, people are reasonably clear on on what the issue they're trying to address is. The the next question is, can the government fix that or is the government best place to fix that through the introduction of a regulator? 
And I think we are where we are today because the market hasn't fixed this itself. And I think if you look back to DCMS select committee reviews going back more than a decade, they're raising a lot of the same points that are being raised today. And I think the government's got to the point where it said, we've given the football sector ample opportunity to resolve this itself and not much has changed. Uh, and therefore, it's time to to try something markedly different. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I suppose from from my perspective, if I sort of play devil's advocate slightly, I think that the point about whether it's the government that should be intervening is probably the one that gets most people talking. I think certainly anyone who's worked within the football industry will, will recognise that financial sustainability is is an issue and is something that, that the, the game has tried to address and perhaps needs to continue to address. Um, but equally, sport, it's often said that it should be politically neutral. It should be um, quite separate from government and the government shouldn't get involved. Um, there's always questions about how how robust that is in, in and of itself, whether that is a sort of paradigm that, that even does exist or should exist. But I think there will inevitably be some hesitancy, I think, from certain courts about the government interfering in the regulation of sport. And that's something that we might come back to when we talk about some of the, the legal and sporting regulatory implications. But also I might ask whether, you know, if the government's intervening in financial issues in sport, whether there are other issues that, you know, concern the public, for example, that it might then in future move into. I'm thinking, for example, of public health concerns surrounding brain injuries in, in football, for example, that obviously affects a huge number of people who play the game. So, you know, when there are so many issues for a for the government of the day to address, I can see why why some might might question whether government is the right place for this to sit with um, or the right people for it to sit with albeit you know clearly it's been an issue that's been around for a very long time and has has as yet been not been addressed sufficiently and the final point if I may add to that it, it is about the impact not only on on communities that, that financial instability has but also on on players and staff and all, all those who are involved in the game and and that's another reason in favour of of regulation here. But it's something that is perhaps conspicuous in its absence from the white paper. You know, obviously we do a lot of work with athletes and, and players within the game. And and obviously when, when a club disappears or goes bankrupt, they're the ones who, who probably suffer most directly. And, you know, with the nature of the market and the transfer system and all the rest of it, it they're often... You know, left in, in pretty vulnerable positions themselves. So they're clearly going to benefit from a system of, of greater regulation, you'd hope. I think in terms of the, is government the right place to do this? I think clearly this is going to be an independent regulator. And that is critical, that it is something that is independent of government. Every independent regulator I've ever met takes that independence very, very seriously. And it will be critical that that is maintained and that this doesn't just become a way of the government playing in things that it probably shouldn't be playing in. That said, the government will create the statute and the regulator will follow that statute. So we can't say this is completely apolitical. I think what a regulator can do is provide external challenge. And that's the role that it can play is to actually say, look, this this is in your best interests to create a, a framework that is financially resilient and is financially sustainable and ultimately it's in your interest as owners and stakeholders within the football sector to have that financial resilience baked in because it, it's not in anyone's interests for for you to lose control of the club and for the, the club to go into administration or get lost completely. Well and, and perhaps picking up on that point about how the regulator might help these clubs, Christina could you perhaps talk us through a little bit about how the regulator is proposed to work generally and whether you have any any concerns about how in practice it might be able to achieve these you know very laudable aims yeah i think i mean generally it's sort of pretty basic and it's very similar to a lot of other regulation we see in place what is interesting is clearly they've tried to balance the idea of and and probably kind of linked to this political interference or lack of political interference and and making sure of kind of independence while also kind of bearing in mind the competitive elements and 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 the fact that you know particularly the premier league 
but generally English football in, in general, we want to be encouraging investment. So the whole way that the kind of system seems to be structured is around a kind of needs-based and risk-based approach. So very kind of individual to each club within the kind of framework of the various kind of aspects. So it's kind of, it's effectively split into four. They're looking at, well, sustainability, financial sustainability is the kind of overall aim, but then they're looking at, you know, appropriate resources and fit and proper custodians and fan interests and approved competitions, which is the interesting one, which I, I know we're going to be talking about later, because I think the other three, it's quite clear why they are, I think, potentially the approved competitions is feels a bit more political in terms of in reaction to the European Super League, rather than necessarily kind of fixing the market problem that we've kind of already been discussing. Chris, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think that's a good overview. So the, the four basic pillars of this are financial regulation, corporate governance, owners and directors tests and the fan engagement with potentially the, the distributions piece on top of that as well. As Christina says, it's a it's a licensing and authorization regime, which is relatively similar to what's already in place in the financial services sector and the licenses that are used to regulate utilities and other things. So this is this is not completely new in that regard. I would say those sort of four or five pillars to this is that's not a small task. That is quite a lot for a regulator to be looking at, but actually it is slightly pared back relative to what was in the fan led review. And I think that's probably the, the right approach to take. There's always the risk with something like this that you try to solve absolutely every single one of football's ills in one go. But actually I think they've tried to focus this much more on the the financial resilience piece and making sure that they have fit, fit and proper owners in place. So I think all, all of that is quite a sensible approach to take. The key questions at this stage, I think there's there's one around where the regulator will sit, which is probably not actually that important, but is of interest. And then I think the more interesting bits are what, what exact powers will the regulator be given and how directive will it allow to be? And you'll hear lots of people saying, it has to be a regulator with teeth. And that's really what those two questions are driving at. What are the powers and how much scope does it have to go out and use those powers to drive change? In terms of the licensing structure, I think I would say that, as Christina was saying, that one of the things that struck me about the white paper is the extent to which it does appear to be a very club by club approach, not necessarily a one size fits all approach and as I understand it what it would mean is that individual clubs would be subject to uh, individuals licensing requirements so there might be special things that one club is, is being asked to look at that another club isn't perhaps because they was assessed at a lower risk for that club in terms of it the way it's being run financially and I guess one of the things that would need to to be looked at there is the extent to which it's fair to have different clubs subject to different licensing conditions. It could be viewed from the perspective of it being an additional burden on some of those clubs having to, to comply with these extra extra requirements. But I could see potentially that it could lead to a benefit as well. So where a club is subject to special licensing conditions, which are about helping them improve their finances over time. I guess there would need to be care taken to the extent to which the regulator doesn't end up distorting the competition by effectively helping some clubs and improving its financial position and not doing the same in, in relation to others. So I wonder if you have any views on either Chris or Christina, any views on, on how that would work in a club by club basis like that. I think it's a really good thing to, to call out. It's something I picked up on as well, and I think it is going to be really important. I mean, the rationale for that is quite clear. You've got clubs starting from def very different positions in terms of their financial resilience and their financial health and just, you know, their business models, the way they operate, their size. That That's quite clear. I think it does raise those questions that you raise around clubs in the same league, potentially competing under slightly different rules and regulations. But you'll have that in place anyway, because... 
in the Premier League, for example, UEFA is imposing a set of squad cost rules that are different from the financial fair play rules that are in place for the rest of the league. So you will already have clubs that are operating under under those different rules and regulations. So I think there's there's pros and cons to this, but I can completely understand where they're coming from by having something that isn't one size fits all, given the very different nature of different clubs. And Christina, what do you do you make of the the financial regulation as, aspect with the white paper? Yeah, I think I mean kind of links the two points together because you can't really have financial regulation without it to a degree being specifically tailored to the particular business that you're looking at because businesses are run in different ways even with the same end game so that kind of makes sense from a business and financial perspective and to be fair if you kind of drill down into the detail the stuff that they're looking at is again fairly kind of basic it's we're not asking for groundbreaking things here things like scenario planning and multi-year forecasting and monitoring and reporting i mean that's you know basic running of a business it's not something that is <laughs> if you looked at it in any other industry and you know you said well we want some scenario planning and some sort of very basic forecasting well they'd turn around and go, well, of course. I mean, that's how you run a business, right? So I don't think it is groundbreaking, but because of the state of the football industry and because of the differences within clubs, even within leagues, the kind of risk-based approach in terms of setting the specific conditions, the specific license makes a lot of sense because it can't possibly be a one-size-fits-all because you've got different types of funding mechanisms, different types of spending, different types of ownership. It's just not really possible to have a one-size-fits-all approach under the circumstances. One sort of implication of that, I suppose, is is that there are, you know, there are 116 clubs, I think the report says, that this sort of licensing system will apply to. And if it's a club-by-club -club approach, it strikes me that that's going to be a fairly significant task for the regulator to deal with. Do you have any understanding, either of you, about how practically this will be done? Because it, it seems to me, upon reading the report, that it will require each club to be looked at separately and, and for all their business plans and, and, and accounts and all the rest of it to be examined so that the, the regulator can really understand how their business works, where their weaknesses are, where their strengths are, all the rest of it. And so that's quite a quite a significant job, isn't it? I think the significant part would be at the start because that's where you're kind of going, right, where do we want to be? Where are we at the moment? And then kind of work towards things because they're working on an advocacy and support kind of basis. Like you say, that's that's quite resource intensive at the start, but then hopefully that will become less resource intensive as, as clubs come up to a certain point. I'm guessing like every other regulator, they're going to have a set of, Basically, this is what we expect. This is this is where the ideal club would be in that particular tier. Obviously, kind of looking at it across the different leagues and what you would expect, because you wouldn't expect the same of a Premier League as you would of a National League club in terms of controls and processes. And then kind of go from there and go, right, what is your governance structure? How risky is that? What controls would we expect given this? So I would expect them to have some sort of game plan before rather than a sort of we're going to look at every club individually and then come up with specific licensing conditions. You'd go the other way. You'd have this is where we'd expect these particular clubs to be. And this is what controls and processes we would expect for a club in this particular area with this particular structure and then compare that to the information that they would bring in. But I agree, at the start, you'd be more resource intensive than you would do kind of on a rolling basis once the system gets started. I'd agree with all of that. That initial authorization process will be a very intensive process to run. I guess the details of the financial regulations will be key and, and most of that's still to be worked out. And the regulator will quite rightly have a lot of discretion in how it designs its framework and what it decides to do with all of that various information that you referred to. I think ultimately what this is, where this will end up is it's an early warning system. 
So you're trying to identify the weaknesses and the problems before they arise and try to work out a way of stopping them from becoming something more material. So it's getting extra checks and balances in that process. Can you bring some more transparency and accountability to that? That that does raise this question that's been raised quite a few times, which is around real-time financial data, and can you get that, and is that achievable? So I think that's going to be a really important element of this, because if you're just looking at accounts a year after, a year and a half after the, the period that you're actually interested in, then this isn't going to be very insightful or helpful. It's going to be too late by the time that, that comes up. So there's a big question there, I think, around what that looks like. And then I think there's a big question of if things do go wrong, actually, what levers can the regulator pull to make things better? And I'll be interested to see see where that ends up, because that that's kind of the elephant in the room of all of this is you can try to identify some of these things on an early warning basis. But actually, do you have any power to correct things when they go wrong? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because I think one of the... Um points I would make about the white paper is it does make absolutely clear that it's not intended to be a zero failure system so you can have the early warnings in place but it's likely to be the case I think that with the best will in the world some clubs will still fail and it will be interesting to see we will never know whether the IRF could have had the benefit of saving Barry or Macclesfield but be interesting to see what effect it could have. Yeah, and I think just on that, because it's an interesting an interesting point, this idea that you can't have a zero failure regime, that is obvious because you need to be able to preserve the incentives. If you say that there's zero failures and no club can ever fail, then at that point you just re- remove any risk of people's actions. So in order to preserve the incentives, you have to say that. But then it does raise the question, is it worth it if we're going to go through all of this effort and we're, we're acknowledging that we can't? prevent there from ever being any failures. I think it can still be worth it if you massively reduce the the likelihood that those failures happen. And that's obviously what the, the regulator is going to be on hook to try and deliver. It's going to be very hard to measure that. And there'll be a, an obvious challenge if we do get five years down the line and the football club's failing for the regulator to say, well, actually, look, there's nothing I could have done about this. But it, my place here is still worthwhile and I am helping to overall achieve something that's that's better. I guess the only other point I would make with regards to financial regulation is it is very easy to to focus on the regulator, but the results of this will depend on how the industry responds. And that will require a, a cultural shift. And there is always a question with this of does the sector want to do that? Will they respond to this in in the right way? Because if they don't, it's a lot harder. And that's one thing I've not seen a lot of commentary on, but you you are effectively trying to take an industry on a journey here and you you need them to be willing participants on that journey and not fighting you at every every corner. Because if, if that's the case, it is going to be significantly more challenging to to improve things. Moving on to the second pillar, perhaps, of the, of the white paper, that around corporate governance and the owners and directors test. What are your guys' views on on the white papers proposals in that regard? Christina, perhaps I'll come to you on that first. Yeah, again, quite normal corporate governance, basic corporate governance suggestions in there. The idea of having a football club corporate governance code that's specifically tailored to football makes sense. I mean, there aren't many sport governance codes around generally, globally. We've obviously got the UK one, which also works on tiered systems. So at least some of the industry, I know it doesn't apply to clubs, it applies to kind of national bodies, but people in the industry would be aware of it and therefore it it won't be something, you know, groundbreakingly new. I think there is a lot to be said for good corporate governance and generally from what can be seen of clubs at the moment, I've done a little bit of work looking at various aspects of board composition, for example, and things like that. And it's it's very clear that the industry as a whole has got some very different approaches to corporate governance than most normal well-run businesses. So it is an area that kind of needed to be looked at. And I think it's it's something that having something specifically tailored to football makes a lot of sense. I don't have too much to add to that, Christina. I I, I think 
there's nothing in that part that should really scare anyone, I don't think, in terms of the corporate governance proposals. There's this reference to an apply and explain model, and I think that gives clubs quite a lot of discretion in terms of how they would actually implement this. And as you say, I mean, this would go slightly beyond the requirements placed on other sectors where they don't meet certain criteria. But overall, there's nothing here that would be significantly different to what would be applied to a, a listed company or a large private company. So I don't see it as a as a scary area for, for the clubs to get on board with. Yeah, I think what, what would be good to, to see in terms of corporate governance structures is for there to be importance based on protection of players and player welfare and along with other members of staff as well, given that Football is a specialist industry with a limited number of jobs and in the case of players, a very short career. The way that clubs treat their players and, and other staff members, including coaching staff, um, technical specialists, like analysts and things like that would be important to, to see those staff members factored into good corporate governance structures. Turning to the to the owners and directors, Tess, more specifically, Christina, was there, was there something you wanted to talk about on, on that side? Now, again, you know, very similar to what you see in, in other industries. Obviously, you've got fit and proper tests in various aspects. I used to work as a forensic accountant, so lots of fun with the FCA in the past. And a lot of this kind of stems from what what I would deem as very basic anti-money laundering controls and anti-bribery and corruption controls and basic corporate governance stuff, looking at ultimate beneficial owners. There's nothing, again, nothing in there that seems so kind of out there and, and stuff that clubs shouldn't already know themselves. So I don't see it as something massively onerous in terms of finding this information or getting this information on board. I think it's it's fairly basic stuff. I think there's some some interesting issues there as well around this idea of, of the review primarily being about the fans, but also about trying to protect the clubs and the examination of owners' backgrounds and beneficial owners and all the rest of it and, and where that sits with the fans. Because we've, we've seen, obviously, recently at Newcastle, you know, lots of people have quite widely condemned the investment that's come from the Saudi Arabia Public Investment Fund, etc., whilst their their own fans are delighted about the the money that's coming into the club, and, and equally, it, there was a mention in the report of what happened at Chelsea recently with the club sort of going into crisis after uh, Roman Abramovich was subject to sanctions, and the report sort of suggests that you know the new regulator would help avoid that sort of crisis, but at the same time, Roman Abramovich was sort of widely revered by Chelsea fans for for many years, so I think it, it will be interesting to see how that sort of circle is squared and how important fans views are in that test and I I would suggest that perhaps they won't be quite as important um, when push comes to shove as as the initial review might perhaps have indicated that they would be in in the functioning of the of, of a regulator and I suppose as these things are developed and more detail is is put in place I think we'd it would be probably good to see more of a reference to certain human rights standards. Again, that was something that wasn't mentioned in the white paper, which was perhaps surprising, given that you know these high-profile cases that I've just mentioned uh, and everyone's aware of, often it's it's those sorts of issues that are, are the ones causing controversy, in addition to obviously the, the more financial ones. I think this is a again, a challenging area, and it will come down to what information is available at the time. Uh, If you think about that case of Roman Abramovich, would the new test have ruled him out in 2003? Very difficult to say. It it would depend on what information you had at the time to do that. It's going to be very hard to design a scheme that can guard against all geopolitical shifts at any point in time. So it's a challenging area. You may have suspicions about people and you may have suspicions about sources of funds, but ultimately very difficult to prove or act on that unless it's uh, very good evidence, I would suggest. But I think where this does help is around the assurances around the adequacy of resources. And clearly there, 
uh, that's targeted at trying to prevent a repeat of the, the takeover of Berry and, and what we saw there. And I think that is where this has the potential to do a lot of good. Moving on to another key issue then, what what do you think about the white paper's proposals for controlling clubs' participation in breakaway league? I can come in on that again as well. I, I mean, I think, it, again, it's a really challenging area. We're seeing in lots of instances at the moment where there are potential allegations of anti-competitive behaviour or foreclosure by putting a restraint on where golfers um, or where football clubs are allowed to compete. And that's been tested in the courts and could go one way or, or another. So I think it, it's it's interesting that the government's chosen to opine on that at this stage already. I think practically this raises some quite interesting questions as to where do you draw the line? So do clubs have to seek permission if they want to go and play in a pre-season tournament in America? Is the regulator going to tell them that they can or, or can't do that? I don't know. But it, it seems like a, an interesting place for the for the government to have got to on this. I wonder if partly this is a bit of a quid pro quo for regulation. So you regulate the league, but you provide some protection of its essential monopoly power by doing this because you, you stop you stop the clubs from uh, from moving elsewhere or breaking away from, from that league. Yeah, in the paper, they seem to try to link it with systemic stability. So I think I think that's kind of where they're heading to with this. But like I said at the start, this one, out of all the kind of parts to it, this is the one that feels the most political and, and it's less clear the link between this and financial sustainability and long-term sustainability of clubs. I think it's probably worth remembering as well that, you know, the Premier League started out as a breakaway league. And so I think what you say, Chris, about this perhaps being a quid pro quo for regulation is is, is probably a really, really good point. And thought about it like that, because it does, the whole system does rest upon the football pyramid as it is now. Um, and it sort of assumes that that is the best way for football to operate. And that there might be some who would say it's not necessarily the best way and that there are other opportunities out there or, or other structures that, that could could be put in place to you know, allow the, the leagues and the sport generally to, to thrive more. You know, for example, it works quite differently in, in, in Europe to how, how sport does in, in America with, you know, tendency in America more towards closed leagues, whereas here we have a system of promotion and relegation. And plenty of people would say, in fact, that that's not a great thing. And, and that introduces quite a lot of financial instability. So it is interesting that it, it sort of inherently does entrench this system that we have. And of course, it you know it corrects the failures that that market produces to, to, to a large degree. But perhaps it, it is the, the quid pro quo, like you say, for these governing bodies or these regulators or the leagues themselves to, to accept government regulation, given that um, that's ultimately in their in their interests. And I guess that is a trade-off that you face if, if as a regulator you're being set up to protect the status quo, which is essentially what this is. How do you make sure that you don't become a barrier to innovation or, or things that may actually be in the interests of not just fans today, but fans of the future? Because maybe actually the fan of the future would quite like to watch a Super League that just has all of the best clubs in, in Europe in it. How do you make that, that trade-off? It's very, very challenging to, to do that. For sure. And one of the other related issues that the White Paper does address is the mechanism that there might be for reaching an agreement between the Premier League and the EFL over the distribution of funds throughout the football pyramid. How do you see this working, Christina? I think it's it's very clear that the government wants to be nowhere near <laughs> this very, very complicated problem of distribution. And, you know, ultimately, as, as somebody who kind of looks at the financial side all the time, it's a very, very complicated problem. So I see why they've said there needs to be a backstop and, and trying to kind of put the regulator in there as to say, look, guys, sort it out. But the predominant message is football, sort it out yourselves. And I completely understand why, because it's a very, very complex issue. And to be trying to tell the Premier League how much money they should be 
passing down the pyramid kind of comes off in in a very kind of wrong manner but also to be saying that clubs should re- receive x number of subsidy and also kind of comes across as wrong and who should it be distributed to and how and it's a very very complicated problem you've also got parachute payments in there you've got cliff edges you know part of the reason why parachute payments exist is because there's such a big drop from the premier league to the championship from the championship to league one and you know as you keep kind of going down how do you solve that problem there's loads of suggestions <laughs> from loads of different people and everybody disagrees on the key problem so i i completely understand the regulate like to to be saying okay we'll try and effectively what it feels like it's football we've given you so many chances and the fan led review it said sorted out by december 2021 then it shifted and it keeps shifting but the message is very clearly get football to sort it out themselves because there're just so many stakeholders and so many different aspects to this problem that actually dictating a solution is probably not it's always going to come with with loads of side effects and problems and therefore at least having football sorted out themselves then they can be you know it's their own side effects and problems that they've caused rather than something that's been dictated down you mentioned there is a backstop though in in the white paper and you know whether it comes into force or into fruition we'll have to wait and see but donna do you What's your take on that from a slightly more legal perspective? Because they talk about sort of a system of mediation and and arbitration. Yeah, that's right. So in the white paper, as as you say, Christina, it talks a lot about football getting on and trying to sort the problem out itself. So, But then if that fails, and obviously the IRF would encourage the parties to resolve the problem, but if that fails, the IRF would then oversee a mediation And then finally, if that fails, the IRF would also decide the outcome in an arbitration. And I think from an legal perspective, I can't think of any other scenario where it would be appropriate to have a body that's the mediator also then be the arbitrator. So I think that's definitely something that's going to need to be looked at in terms of what that backstop really can look like in in resolving this issue. Ben, looking at some of the other legal implications did you want to to speak about some of those yeah i mean th- there's a potential for a, for a huge number of legal consequences to arise from the introduction of an iref but you know a few i think we'll probably just try and mention a, a, a few of them i mean f- firstly there's mention in the white paper about there being a, a mechanism created for iref's decisions to be challengeable before courts or tribunals on judicial review principles and obviously the, the the creation of a uh, of an arm's length governmental body raises the question of judicial review as well and that's something that previously has has been outside of the the sporting sphere something that ha- has been deemed inappropriate to to apply to sports governing bodies but it will be interesting to see how how that issue evolves with the IRF's introduction and, and development and there's an interesting point made in in the white paper about introducing a regulator to help avoid drawn out legal proceedings i think as as a reference to some of the challenges to the regulations that have existed within football uh, governing financial sustainability and i'm i'm not entirely convinced that simply introducing a, an independent regulator will necessarily avoid drawn out legal proceedings because uh, there's obviously going to be a mechanism for challenging iref decisions and like i mentioned you know we could even have the potential of of judicial review and all all sorts of legal proceedings can often become drawn out. So I'm I'm not I'm not sure that there will be necessarily a, a big big change on that front. And one of the other points I I wanted to raise, which links back to what we were talking about at the beginning about the sort of government involvement in sport, relates to to FIFA's statutes because under under the FIFA statutes, Articles 15 and 19, the, the idea is that a member association of FIFA. So the National Football Association here, the FA, is the primary regulator of football within their jurisdiction. And when that isn't the case, FIFA has in the past taken action against its member associations. Um, So, for example, uh, recently, the Kenyan Football Association, uh, the Zimbabwe Football Association, they've been suspended from, from FIFA membership as a result of government involvement in the governance of football in, in, in those countries. 
and, and in those situations, for example, the government had, had in, interfered in order to address financial corruption concerns. And there's also been, you know, there's been a number of these cases over the years, another involving Kuwait, where there was legislation introduced, which included the power for the government to dissolve sports clubs, which is perhaps not all that different to legislation which gives the re- independent regulator power to stop a club from participating in, in one of the English football leagues, which is effectively what the licensing scheme would propose when it comes to enforcement. And just to sort of reflect on what the FIFA statutes say specifically, they talk about each member association managing its affairs independently and without undue influence from third parties. They also talk about the member association statutes guaranteeing independence and avoiding any form of political interference, as well as providing that the member association has primary responsibility to regulate matters, including club licensing. So I think you can probably tell from 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 those sort of extracts where the potential issue, you know, potential conflicts could arise, and it will be very interesting to see what, if anything, FIFA has to say about this proposal. If it's certainly if it's taken any further. I don't think we yet know what FIFA's position on it is, but it's um, certainly one to keep your eye on, I think. Yeah, definitely. And to add, in, in FIFA statutes, they also make clear that they don't recognise that external body. And so, yes, we say, Ben, it would be interesting to see what FIFA have to say about this. And then in terms of the licensing system as well, i am say that that raises some, some issues around contract. So if a club has a license removed, I think it would be need to be very clear what, what players can do in circumstances if their club that they're playing for has its license taken away. I guess that would also have some imp- implications in terms of the timing of how things are run behind the scenes with the regulator, whether there'll be specific timeframes by which they need to set out whether clubs have their license for that season or, or not. And then this licensing issue will impact on other contracts such as sponsorship and investment deals. So lawyers will be definitely, I'm sure, considering the implications of the system on existing contracts and and how that risk can be dealt with in in future contracts. And I guess finally then, what impact do you think the regulator will have in the short, medium and long term? Barton, with you, Chris. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'll start with the short term. And by that, I, when I think of short term, I mean next sort of 18 months or so. And I would say in the next 18 months, probably not much in terms of direct impact. It's going to take some time to implement the legislation. It's going to take some time to get this regulator set up and get the systems in place. There may be some indirect impact. There may be some pressure on the Premier League to make concessions to avoid the potential worst case on on some of this regulation, particularly around distributions. Can can it do more to to strike a deal on that and and therefore try and get something a bit more favourable from the regulatory framework? That's a possibility. But in terms of direct impact, we're not going to see any of that in the short term. I think medium term, there's this very interesting question around the sort of day one risk which is what happens when the regulator looks at this and tries to authorise all the clubs. How bad will it be? Um, and and how destabilising will that initial licensing processing be? Because if the regulator finds that actually a very significant proportion of the clubs don't meet the requirements for a licence, clearly there's going to be a transition period, but that it could be potentially quite destabilising for for the industry to go through that process. So I think that will be an interesting one to keep an eye on. The reason we're bringing in this licensing regime is because the financials are so bad. If your first criteria is financial adequacy, well, there's a good prospect that a lot of people aren't going to meet that criteria. So um, that'll be an interesting one to keep an eye on. And then in the long term, I hope (laughs) at least that this leads to stronger financial resilience. And as I say, that early warning system that that stops the worst of these issues from materialising. And Christina? I'd agree with a lot of that. Uh, I think what you might start seeing in the short term is some clubs starting to professionalise a little bit more, short to medium term in kind of anticipation of this, this coming about. And I think 
or I can definitely foresee sort of depends on how long term long term is. But with improved corporate governance, you also tend to get a lot of other positive unintended consequences. So some of the criticisms I've heard come around is about the fact that the white paper doesn't mention the environmental side and also it's very light on ed and i were like yeah this is not part of the white paper we're just going to ignore it but actually those are things that you tend to find that do improve with better decision making and better corporate governance around the whole kind of structure and the whole round decision making as a whole so kind of more long term also kind of quite positive in terms of investment what we tend to see in football at the moment a lot of it's either private equity or private funds we also see that there's a lot of banks and financial institutions that are unwilling to loan to football clubs. And I think that's something that kind of long term, we'd kind of see a bit of a reversal in that and see a little bit more kind of general investment because of the, the general due diligence process will be easier. And also, you know, with financial sustainability comes a bigger willingness to lend and to, to invest. So I think long term, it could be very good for the industry. But yeah, there will be short term costs and and changes that will be required in order to get there. So it is a journey and it needs to be viewed that way by the industry. And I agree with Chris's point earlier. We'll see how how much the the industry is willing to engage with that. And I think that will deem a lot of how successful this whole process is. A number of really interesting points, I suppose, without wanting to be too much of a negative Nelly, I, I, I think my first question, question is you know, how soon or if at all we will see this acted upon you know the report does make clear that this is something that will be dealt with when parliamentary time allows about whether it's something that should 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 be done at all and so you know I suppose there is the risk that that with future political changes this might not be something that ever even makes it into into legislation obviously for, for all those who've worked worked very hard on it we can hope that that's that isn't the case but it will be. It was something that I think time time will tell as to, to how, if at all, this is going to to make a change. And the the other point I just wanted to make very briefly is about the other indirect impacts we might see, which is well, if this does work in football, or if this is adopted in football, what other sports might see a similar regulator introduced? I, I think primarily of of rugby union, which has obviously suffered some some very well publicised financial crises recently. And you know, if, if I appreciate that rugby doesn't have the same financial reach that football does, but if this is something that works, maybe it's something that will be adopted in other sports in future. I think just to, to add to what you were saying, Ben, in terms of the risk with future political changes, I would add that you know, concern around whether it may or may not come in shouldn't be a reason to to rush into to implementing it before. You know, further care has been taken into to looking at the details to how it would work. So I would agree with Chris that in the next 18 months that maybe not much can really happen or will really happen because there's a lot of work I think that needs to be done to work out how this, how to structure it properly so that there aren't any negative consequences of implementing the system. And I think on that point, this is one of those things that no one wants to get wrong. Absolutely. Because if you are seen to be the, the, the ones who've messed this up, then that's not where anyone wants to be. So I actually think going slow on this isn't necessarily a, a bad idea and get it right the first time. Well, thank you, everyone. And thanks in particular to Christina and Chris for chatting with us today. For more information on Morgan Sports Law's football practice, check out our website at morgansl.com. If you'd like to join our mailing list, or if there are any topics you'd like us to cover on future podcasts, please email us at podcasts at morgansl.com. Finally, please connect with us at Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook for articles, updates and news. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll join us again for future episodes of Play On. Thank you.